everyone, and we are here at uh, Linux Conference Australia, LCA 2018, and today uh, we're here with uh, ID Waterhouse. ID is a uh, developer advocate and a technical writer traveling the world to talk about documentation, deployment, and neurodiversity. She's especially interested in terrible IT disasters. Uh, thanks, Heidi. I'll leave the room to you. Please welcome Heidi. Thank you all. Mic working? Yes? Okay, good. So you have showed up because you're awesome and you actually want to learn about documentation. But before we start, I want to say that it is Australia Day and I'd like to show my respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land elders past and present on which this meeting takes place. I think it's important, especially on Australia Day, to say we all came from somewhere and we're all going somewhere and hopefully together. So, so I have been thinking a lot about documentation for the last two decades. I've been a technical writer. Um, that means I started when I was 10, obviously. The thing about open source is that how many of you have been able to hire a technical writer for an open source project? You, you are the lucky you. Percentage wise, oh, oh. percentage wise that's not real great because it turns out that uh, free and open source software is not super well funded and the funding that we have tends to go to fixing obviously broken things. And because we built it, we don't think of the documentation as obviously broken because we know how it works. It turns out that we could get more people to use FOSS software if it were more usable. I'm really firmly convinced of that, but you don't have any money to hire people and you don't have the skills to write good documentation yourself because it's a learned skill, just like any other language. So let's talk for a bit. It's going to be mostly talking. You don't need your laptops. I wish I had some paper that I'm going to hand out, that I could hand out later, but um, Australia Day is the 4th of July and I forgot to buy anything ahead of time, so we're going to, there's blank paper, oh, there is, excellent. We're going to be great. Um, I forgot to buy some of the stuff, but that's okay. So. My name is Heidi Waterhouse, and I'm here because I want you to be happier writing documentation. I work for a company called Launch Darkly. We do feature flags as a service, and if that sounds intriguing to you, come talk to me about it. Uh, and you can find me at Wired Ferret on Twitter is probably the fastest way to get a hold of me. So we're going to do a little fast history of technical documentation because this is not yet boring to all of you. Hopefully. So for a long time, technical documentation was linear writing. It was people read every word of the things that were written down on paper, and the emphasis was on understanding and doing. And you can think of go ahead, technical documents that you read like this, like uh, you opened a new computer box and there were instructions on how to put your chip on your motherboard, right? They were on paper, they had some steps, you could follow them, you could accomplish your task. Um, it was really useful for people who wanted to do things the right way. And uh, for a long time, computers worked best that way. So linear documents, they stacked up, they're hard to read, but they go through and, and help you out. In the early 90s, the web rebels came up with a different idea. We started doing what we call task-based writing. Rather than saying, here's the PXQR77 system, I'm going to tell you everything about it, what we did was say, hey, I heard you're trying to install a chip. Here's how do you install a chip. So we broke those long, long books into tasks that you could define and almost test. Uh, we now call it task-based writing or uh, test-driven documentation. If you can't test it, it's not really a procedure. Uh, it was invented by the web rebels and it was 
modular, emphasized the user experience, and out of it came this interesting uh, thing, the, the Darwin information type architecture, where we said there were three main kinds of things that we put in documentation. The concept, why or how something works, the procedure, how you make it work, and the reference, which is how things are going to, am I wandering around too much? Uh, which is how things uh, you might want to refer to later, but don't actually need to make everything work the first time. So you can think of like API documents are frequently a reference document. Uh, the 90s were a grim time for, oh, you lost the audio? Thank you. If it were easy, everyone would do AV. It's a hard job. <laughs> okay, better? Nope. Nope. I can project to a room this size, but people will be sad in the end. Better? No. All right. Uh, we're, you, you figure out what happened, and I'm going to keep going a little louder. All right. The 90s were a grim time because we were trying to figure out how to use the web effectively, and mostly what we were building was pages that flashed a lot. Um, if you were not around for web development then, it was only by the grace of God that we escaped from this without our souls contained in frames, like a <sighs> demon in a salt circle. After we did task-based writing, we started to do object-oriented writing. And this is a thing that technical writers loved, and nobody understood what we were doing. It was sort of like an arcane priesthood. We used content as code. We used tags. We inserted. We had inclusions. We had conditionals. Everything was amazing, but it only worked when it was compiled. And I had 800-page documents that had like 40-minute compilation times. And if I screwed up any of my variables, uh, I had to go redo the whole thing. And it wasn't that my computer was that slow relatively, it's that it was that much code. So object-oriented writing was favored by technical writers and translators and people who sell technical writing software because they were like $2,000 a seat license. And they looked like this. If you look at this screen, you will notice that uh, regular conditions were, or regular expressions were in fact a big part of my life. Uh, that actually conveys information to me about how numbering is going to work in my chapter and on my page. And uh, all of these things were meaningful to me, but it's really like I was using an IDE to do English. Uh, this was great because if you knew this, you got paid a fair amount of money, almost as much as a programmer. Uh, but it was also terrible because programmers were like, I'd actually rather not learn a whole nother IDE to be able to contribute to the documentation. After that, we ended up with guerrilla writing. People were doing it on their own. Stack Overflow is like the ultimate example of guerrilla writing because people were not getting the answers they needed from documentation or support, and they were helping each other. This was mostly frustrated people who weren't writers trying to help their peers. This was every time you Googled an error message and you got some super weird arcane procedure on how to fix it. We now solve this with YouTube videos, which I find fascinating. Like, the last time I needed to fix something in Windows 10, the only solution was to watch a, a YouTube video on how to fix it. I'm like, that's really non-portable, but it did fix my problem. Whatever you could think to type in a search box became a documentation result. And whatever people put up became searchable. So it wasn't so much documentation as a general free-for-all of answers that might or might not have value. I have been advocating something called search-first writing, which assumes that you are going to write some kind of documentation and people are going to come to it through search. They are not going to read your documentation in order. They are not even necessarily going to come in from your page. They're going to be searching on an error code and I hope you're the one to provide the answer for them. It's tool agnostic. 
It has all the information and links you need to solve a problem on one page. And it's mostly designed by people who have answered phones sometime in their life. They're just like, here's the answer. Please go away. Um, search first writing is super powerful, but you actually have to know the answers in order to provide it. So that's a brief history of how technical writing happened and how we've ended up at this sort of fragmented place where we don't know exactly how technical writing works, except we know that we're not hiring technical writers. So let's talk a little bit about technical writing tools. Let's make some words. Technical writing is really just a different way to do journalism. You can do almost all the tech writing you need if you know the five W's, which are not actually all W's because journalists are evidently really bad at spelling. Who? Yeah, but that's, this is my version. But who, what, when, where, how, and why? If you could answer all of those questions about your product, you'd be pretty good to go. So when you're writing technical documentation, I've, I've refined this down into who am I writing for? What do they need to know? How can I find that out to tell them? How can I explain it so they understand it? Who can help me explain this? And who can test it to make sure I got it right? Because I assure you, your technical documentation is not any more complete without testing than your code is. Are you going to ship code that hasn't been tested? Please say no. <laughs> you should also not ship documentation that hasn't been tested by someone who isn't you. It doesn't have to be elaborate. It doesn't have to be a big user, like variable driven thing. But you have to have somebody look at your documentation and actually try and execute it before you release it. Otherwise, you're polluting your information stream. So one of the things that I said is, who are you writing this for? And the answer can be a lot of different things, and it changes how you write it. So if you're writing it for users, that's one thing. If you're writing it for your future self, that's sort of a different thing. So if you know who you're writing for, it makes it a lot easier to tune what you're writing. If you're writing for another sysadmin like you who does, in fact, know what a command line is, that's, that's easy. If you're writing it for somebody who doesn't know what a command line is, you may have to back up several steps and say, like, OK, here's how you get to a command line. Here's how you type things in. Try not to type these things. Don't write down the things they shouldn't type, because they will type them. Um, <laughs> Don't, don't ask how I figured that out. Um, the basics for writing good technical documentation are actually relatively simple. And we'll go into them in a little more depth. depth. Your sentences should be short and clear. You should have graphics for concepts, but not screen captures. You should use style guides, which are basically linters for English. And you can write linters that will examine your English, or you can get them on, like, online. There's a ton of excellent uh, linters, both for accessibility and uh, diversity and inclusivity that will flag your writing if you're saying something inappropriate. Um, and you should remember that accessibility is a real thing, and not everybody can read the same way we do. So words with pictures is what I'm saying when I say don't use screen captures. Because screen captures are extremely fluid. They move very fast. You change your interface design relatively rapidly, even if you don't change a procedure. So you want to make sure that you're using things that describe the, the flow of a project or the architect's, architectural conception of a project, but not necessarily this is the interface. Because you will get caught on that, and it will be wrong eventually. Uh, never include settings only in an image, because not everybody can see images. And also, uh, you can't OCR that very effectively. So if you have any settings, you're like, set your screen to look like this. I'm judging you. You can remember this in two years. You're like, that lady with the pink hair is judging me. Put the settings below the screen capture if you have to have the screen capture. And screen captures are problematic for low vision people. They are high bandwidth, 
So let's remember that not everybody has a ton of bandwidth. They don't all live in the city. And um, they're going to change. They're going to change really rapidly, so don't do it. I just included this because uh, screen captures are problematic, and, and so is her food. Animated GIFs. OK, they're terrible. Um, not all of your users are readers. And I think that's something that is especially true in this community because people who need to hack their systems for accessibility frequently go to free and open source rather than proprietary methods. So some people can't see well. Some people have trouble parsing language. They have uh, reading disabilities. Uh, some people have terrible equipment, like you're reading this on a flip phone somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And I want you to remember that when I say some people, some people is us. And if it isn't us right now, it is us in the future. It is eventually you have lost your reading glasses and you can't see your phone and your arm is not long enough. If you remember that people are going to be needing adaption and uh, ease of use, you're going to build better textual uh, textual setups so that people can use them. So when I'm saying that, I've, accessibility is not a checklist. Checklists help, they're useful, but it's an attitude about how you think about people. How you remember that not everybody is just like us. That not everybody has two hands or a thumb or the ability to type rapidly or the ability to see the screen. Not everybody. And that's going to help you a lot. So one of the things that is the scariest about writing both code and documentation is the blank page. How many of you start coding by just opening up a screen and having nothing there? A few of you, but not everybody. Lots of us are like, huh, I'm going to borrow this thing that's kind of like what I want, and I'm going to tweak a bunch of other things about it. And eventually, it may be 100% new material. But mostly, when we stare into the blank page, the blank page stares back at us. And like the abyss, we're a little worried about it eating our soul. So one of the ways you can avoid this is to have a template. It really reduces your friction to get started. I uh, sincerely advocate using some kind of format to do this because it's going to make both your output and your, your output will be more consistent and your input will be easier. So for an example of this, think about writing a bug. There are some things that you always want to know about a bug. Now I could write two paragraphs about what I was trying to do when this bug occurred. But I might forget which version number it's in. So when you use uh, Bugzilla, right, something like that, uh, it asks you what version. It asks you what module. It asks you what you were trying to do. It asks you what happened, what you expected to have happen. We fill in this form, and we don't think of it as technical writing. But all templated writing can be technical writing. So. Don't solve that problem over and over again. Just do it once. Say, these are the things that a person needs to know. And I'm going to make some forms that include all of that, those blank spaces. And you're going to fill them out. It adds the standardization with a really low mental cost, which is amazing and super useful. And it feels kind of like Mad Libs. And I was asking my Australian friends if this was a thing in this country. And they were sort of like, oh, what? Mad Libs, is this a thing in this country? Have you have an alternative? What's your alternative? Uh, whose, line is it anyway? whose line is it anyway? Huh, I think of that as a comedy show. Well, sorry, I no, it's fine. So Mad Libs is a children's game that we use on long car drives. Uh, where there's a story that has blanks that say things like fill in a verb, fill in a color, fill in a, an adjective. And one person asks the questions, that, like give me a verb. And the other person can't know what the story is about. So when you fill them all in, it says, 
One day, I was driving down the, car, uh, the, the road in a blue UFO when suddenly bubbles popped out of the... And it's very silly because you don't know what story you're filling in. This, um, this ease of use, this just give me a verb, is something that I really want us to bring to technical writing in our world because there's no reason we have to recreate the wheel all the time. So once you've written some words, you have this giant mound of wiki, right, maybe. Remember that here are the things to succeed. Most people don't need the whole concept in order to execute a command. Uh, in fact, it's sometimes unhelpful because the further down the rabbit hole you go, the more if-then clauses they're holding in their brain, the less effective they are at doing the thing you want. So you don't need the whole concept, but you do need to answer the question that they searched on, which frequently starts with, how do I? And if you can't say, this document answers, how do I? Then you failed at technical documentation, and you should take all of the information and start over. And remember that search terms are precious, precious gold. This is a really interesting idea because we tend to think of indexes as something that is a universal reflection of everything that exists in our documents, and that's not true. So here are some search terms and requests that I've compiled. Um, people phrase them in really different ways, and they, uh, and it's almost generational. So my kids, who the oldest is turning 15 next week, uh, use natural language search. Like when I learned to Google natural language search just confused search terms, like the word how, you, you just didn't use that, you're just like fix thing with thing. Okay, that would get you reasonable search results. My kids are like, how do I with the and the? Okay, that gets them useful search results because search has come a long way. So remember when you're writing indexes, people are going to be coming in from all generations and all search styles. Put a tracker on your inbound and see what people are coming to you from. Like you want to know what the search terms are that people are using to get to you so that you can keep feeding that or so that you can correct it. But probably if they're getting to your site using these search terms, you want to be answering those questions. It's like a freebie. People are asking this, they want to know it, write that document, you're a hero. So all of the words present are indexed. That doesn't mean all of the words present are useful search terms. You want to make sure you don't have any false pointers. Um, I used to hate this when I was doing documentation. It would be like, how not to drive. And if you searched how to drive, how not to drive would show up again because uh, not was discarded as, a, as an unuseful word. And I'm like, that's actually exactly the opposite of what I was looking for. Please don't give me that. When a human indexes things using human language, as they use terms that, that we use as well as the proper terms. So have you ever worked for a product that had a name nobody called it by? And they all called it something else? All right, what do we call this? Blue screen of death. Until 2013, Microsoft did not return any answers about this when you search the Microsoft site for blue screen of death because they don't call it a blue screen of death. They call it like a, a fatal exception. So internally, that's not what they called it, but all of the rest of us in the world were like, blue screen of death, why? And we weren't getting any answers from Microsoft because nobody at Microsoft thought about what we called it. Nobody is saying your exact branding. That's not how humans work. So if you are only search responsive to your exact branding, you're missing a ton of stuff out there. Go out on Stack Overflow, go out on your community forums, find out what people are calling your software, and make links between that name and your answers. All right, we are going to do our, our first exercise here in a moment. Semantics. Semantic tagging splits the form 
of text and the content of text. It makes it possible to reuse chunks of text. It saves duplication, but you might have to recompile it. So you all know a bunch of semantic tags. I know you do. And I'm going to hand out some paper. And in your tables, I want you to see if you can come up with some semantic tags that you've seen. And I'm going to walk around and we'll talk about them a bit. OK? And also, the AV guys can figure out what's up with the sound, maybe. So here's a bunch of paper. Who wants to help me hand out paper? Jack. How many per page? Oh, per just like, a just a couple. Yeah, that's really interesting because I didn't give you right away the key, which is the word metadata. But metadata is how we describe everything about text that isn't text. And I think it's a super interesting problem to understand you can have the same words in H1 or footnote, and that changes their meaning by changing their context. So I think that's a super uh, exciting way to think about all of your text is to say, how can you change meaning without changing content? So that's the exercise. I'm not going to grade you on it. I hope you all had a little fun talking about it. I'm not grading you. Too bad. Wake up. OK. So you want to sort your topics into buckets. Ideally, you've used a template and written a whole bunch of topics that have sort of similar structure. But now the thing is that we need to sort them so that people can find them. Because even with search, you need some organization. Um, I don't always teach this. If I'm teaching strict DevOps docs, I am like, please put everything in one giant file so everybody knows where it is and they can just grep the hell out of that one file. Um, but if you're doing user documentation, it's kind if you associate similar things. So group items by how they get used, not how they get programmed. It's a really easy mistake to make if you're up to your elbows in code all day to assume that things that are similar to you are similar to the user. And that is not always true. So think about how to pull things together in a way that makes it obvious that they're related. For instance, I type Dvorak because I'm that kind of weirdo. And um, I, every time I use a new system, I have to decide if it's a language or a keyboard layout or keyboard style. Or if you would put all of those things together in weird typing styles for me so that I could just find them all at once, that would be super useful. So when you're thinking about how to put your stuff in buckets, Think about how people use them, not how you built them. When you're writing instructions, you always want to give people a next step. You want to say, here is what you're going to do. That's the test description, right? We're going to install your router. And then you give them the instructions in a numbered sequence. And then you say, the test conclusion, you should be able to ping your router by this command. And then you want to give them the next step. You want to say, now that you've installed your router, please go configure your security, for the love of God. Um, don't just abandon them on the page, because they came to this page for search, so they don't have a through line otherwise. If you don't give somebody a next step, you're leaving them isolated on an island instead of giving them a road to walk down. Offer people a chance to see the documentation structure. Um, this is a little bit harder programming-wise, but not like unachievable. So they can see where they are in a procedure of multiple steps. 
So you're like, you're on step five of 18, setting up your home system. That'd be great. So when you're writing a procedure, remember that people have come to it, probably you know, from search, and they need to know where to go next. So I am not going to do the card sorting because aforementioned I'm bad at holidays, um, but I'll describe it a little bit, which is to say I give each group a set of index cards that have some menu titles on them, and I ask people to sort them. And what always happens is that people sort them in different orders according to their experience. And it's really interesting to look into this. I actually did this card sorting exercise for uh, a group at Red Hat with Trello. I wrote up a blog post on it, it's on OSDC. Um, but like using Trello to sort things into logical menu items was really a cool, fun idea. Uh, when you work with a group, you have to compromise and, and communicate about why you want something in a particular order, and that's really useful. So we've written some words, we've organized some words. It turns out that the words don't do any good sitting on our own system. We have to distribute them to other people somehow. So let's think about the ways we can do this. We have static sites, which are great because they're easy to get and easy to maintain. Um, they're hard to lock down, but if you don't have like proprietary information in your documentation, who cares? There's hosted sites, which have the advantage of somebody else takes care of the security for you, and it's easier to do granular uh, user access, but it's almost impossible for contributors to access them to contribute without a whole bunch of gatekeeping. There's baked into product help sites, which have a lot of problems because they only update with the product, so however often you release, that's how often your docs release. Uh, and they're only available to customers. And I don't know about you, but when I'm evaluating a, a product that I want to buy, I like to go read the documentation a little bit. I don't actually like reading documentation. If I liked reading documentation, I would have, wouldn't have become a technical writer. Like the best thing about tech writing is you never have to read the docs because they don't exist. <laughs> um, and it's really, really hard to encourage like anybody who isn't on your team to contribute because they have to like, I don't know, email you stuff or put it on a portal and then it has to get approved and then it's part of the build process and it's super unrewarding. So you have a lot of control, but you don't have a lot of input. Um, Knowledge-based content management systems. And uh, this also includes wikis. It's useful for a community that knows what it wants. If your community is robust, you can probably make this work because people will keep contributing and people are invested in the documentation being good. Uh, but they are prone to aging and rot. I keep saying that my ideal Confluence plugin uh, actually ages the CSS by 10% paler every month so that at the end of a year, your, your page is white on white. The content is still there, but you know that it's old and decayed because you can't read it. I think that would be perfect because it's so hard to tell when content is old. And we assume that people are going to look at the, the date on the header, and that is not a thing that happens. I don't look at the date on the header. I'm like, why didn't this work? I'm, then I look at the date, I'm like, 2007. I'm, I'm having some ideas about why that didn't work. So. The other problem is that uh, because it's community built, it sometimes diverges from the published docs or the community message. Uh, so you end up with this thing where there's like this splinter faction of power users who have taken your, your community and run with it in a totally different direction, um, which never happens in this community. Um, so one of the things that I miss and uh, we'll probably never get back, is professional writing tools. You remember the horrifying screens I showed you sooner, or earlier? Uh, they were great. They were shiny and powerful. They had a learning curve like driving a Mack truck into a brick wall. There was just like headaches for months. Um, it was an IDE, and it enabled all sorts of really powerful things like multi-client single sourcing, and variables, and references, and inserted objects, and and cross connections like you would not believe. 
Um, but it was an exclusive priesthood, and it was really expensive, and that's not going to happen. So one of the other ways that we distribute things is paperish things. It is essential for some, some topics, like uh, quick start guides for your phone. You need that to be on paper because you can't boot your phone up to read the phone stuff. So you need like how to insert your battery to be on paper. Um, a lot of people find it really reassuring. When I was a baby tech writer, I said like we have PDFs, it was a long time ago, uh, we have PDFs, why do we have to print literally 500 page manuals? And the answer was these developers felt better if they had something to put their coffee mugs on, <laughs> literally. I ended up putting like a cellophane top to the documentation so that the coffee stains didn't show as much. But they just felt better having physical documentation in case everything went down. And on a related note, um, it's really important to understand whether the people using your documentation will be online or offline when they're using it. I had a raging fight with Microsoft in 2008 uh, while I was working for them. The Microsoft server documentation team wanted to go to documentation on demand, which means that when you asked for a topic, it got served from the web. The advantage of this is that you had instantly new documentation and it was current and everything. The disadvantage of this is nobody lets their servers touch the internet. It's like licking a dirty toilet. If you were in the server room, you are not connected to the internet. So every machine that had Windows Server was cut off from documentation on demand. And when you went back to your desktop to try and find that topic on your Windows desktop machine, it wasn't a server machine. And so you couldn't get the documentation. Um, I, I, don't, I don't understand why this was such a hard concept. I'm still obviously mad about it 10 years later. Uh, <laughs> but you need to think about that problem. Like, can people touch the internet while they're reading this? Do they need to? Is there a way to make this offline? Does it need to be paper? Does it need to be PDF? Does it need to be like static HTML that they can download? Do you need to compensate for the fact that not everybody has 100% on internet all the time? So I already talked some about templates and using templates to publish. But I want to say that one of the great things about this is that it's almost, almost push button. You can do a unified look and feel. People are just typing things in. You can enforce consistency and not missing things by saying, hey, you missed a field. I'm not publishing it until you put something in that field. Also, I put a linter on, so if you type foo in that field, I will still reject it. Um, and templates are a built-in checklist of things that you need to understand and document before you can move on. So I think that's a super useful way to both uh, write and distribute things. So it turns out that we can't do all of our technical writing ourselves, and we have to work with other people. So templates as an invitation are less scary than a blank page. They set expectations. They encourage multiple writers. Here is my one weird trick for getting information out of even the most um, hostile dev. I do a little research. I write up something full in the knowledge that I've probably gotten it wrong. I give it to the expert, and then they delightedly fix it because they really love being right and watching me be wrong. And I got the right information out of them, and they got a happy feeling. So all you have to do is be willing to look like an idiot. And I am totally willing to look like an idiot if it means I get correct information into the documentation. Um, I have a bunch of how to get information out of devs things uh, that stem a lot from my early career in uh, newspaper reporting. But mostly it involves lowering the barrier to entry making it seem easy, and rewarding people for giving me information. For a long time, I was a uh, cookie rewarding person. If people gave me things, I would come in, and they would get the, the first access to the cookie stash. Um, but when I went remote, I had to figure out other ways to, to work around this, because you can't just like send cookies to Boston or whatever. 
I mean, you can, but it's not as immediate a reward. The most useful book I have ever read for corporate uh, life is called The Power of Positive Dog Training. And it is literally a dog training book. And it's all about uh, breaking down the steps of what you want and rewarding things immediately when you get them so that people continue to offer them to you. Uh, it seems super cynical, but honestly, if it makes everybody happier, I don't see a problem with it. Um, if you are trying to get something done, it's a great idea to have a hack day. You want to set some goals for your, your documentation hack day and keep track of things that you can't fix today but you find. And remember that team building is sometimes about mastery, autonomy, and purpose and not mini golf. Although they do start the same, one of them actually builds your team as a functioning group and one of them involves like bitterness over putt-putt. So I really encourage people to do documentation hack days every couple, like twice a year, especially if you have a wiki that just like grows out of, out of all recognition. Uh, hack day is a great way to prune it back and make it something useful. And the other thing that you can do with a hack day is it's a chance for whatever technical documentation person you have or person who cares about it to really shine and say, look, here's some things that I've been thinking about. Here's our backlog. Let's see how much of this we can get through. One of the things I care about is deleting words. So it turns out that we are hoarders. And the cheaper storage has gotten, the worse this problem has become. And I literally have a whole nother talk about how we need to throw more stuff away because stuff is just a threat surface. And by stuff, I usually mean like files, because please don't ask me how much yarn I have. Um, but let's talk about what to delete. You want to delete stuff that is old and wrong and terrible. And you want to delete wrong stuff that is hiding right stuff. The fewer words you have, the more likely people are to read them. Like these slides are actually too busy for my current standard, but it's easier to teach this way. What you want to do is get rid of everything, everything that you don't need. And it's terrifying. So you want to delete anything wrong, anything dangerous. And by dangerous, I don't just mean like things that are, are company secrets. I also mean, you know that thing where it's like config.final? Config.final, final, really I mean it, final. Config2. Which of those is the correct one to keep and which one to run and which one to delete? Yeah. You want to take all of the things that might be run accidentally out of, out of the uh, realm of possibility. And if something hasn't been used or updated in a large number of years, it's either completely structural and you can't touch it, and please check before you take it out, or it's outgrown and useless, and you should get rid of it. If it's completely structural and nobody's touched it in a long time, you have another problem, and you should go fix it, because people should be looking at even structural code every so often to make sure there aren't latent bugs in it. So how do you learn to delete things? Delete things temporarily. It's much less alarming to say, I'm going to move all this stuff to a file that in two months will automatically delete itself. That way, if you need it in two, you know, within the two months, you can go retrieve it. Probably you don't. Automating the deletion is going to make sure that you don't like put it off a little bit more, because what if you need it? Uh, delete based on analytics. Make sure that you run some analytics on how often you use stuff. And if you don't use it, get rid of it. It's not doing you any good just existing. And delete ruthlessly, because it turns out you don't need all of that stuff. You're just keeping it for emotional comfort. Oop. I took out a, a um, thing that we're going to do. I want you to all take out your mobile phones if you have them. We're going to do a group exercise. Deletion. It's going to be great. All right. 
you don't, <laughs> nice try. All right, I want you to open your picture app. I want you to open your picture gallery and delete the first blurry photo you see. I know, what if it's my child? What if it's my dog? Yeah, <laughs> Delete a picture. It's a little hard. You're like, what if I need that fourth selfie? Because that was the one with the perfect duck, duck lips, right? Gone. All right. Now, now that you've deleted one, how easy do you feel like it would be to delete a second? It's a gateway drug. Spend a day deleting stuff. Go through your old files and say, do I really need that? Sure, you can keep it. It's not hurting anything. It's a tiny fraction of your storage space, but it's also a tiny sliver of vulnerability. It's a tiny way that somebody can get to you. It's a tiny, tiny drain on your cognitive resources. Sorry, what? <laughs> Can I have, come have a chat with your mom? No, no, that's your job. Good luck. You could buy her the Swedish art of death cleaning, which is the, the uh, Swedish, at about 65, when they retire, they just start cleaning their houses out so that their um, poor, suffering children don't have to do it. I'm like, this is genius. I bought my mom a copy. She's like, do you have something to tell me? I'm like, yes, I don't want to clean your house out. Um, think about how much cognitive load, how much like time you spend scrolling past pictures you're not gonna keep, copying files you're not gonna use again, keeping and storing and preserving things that actually literally no longer have software that can read them. Like, I have a bunch of Lotus 1, 2, 3 files. It's a long story and I'm old, but what if I need them? Well, if I need them, I'm in deep shit because I, yeah, it's like three conversion steps at this point, right? Nobody's reading those files anymore. So if it's something you want to keep, every few years you should go update it to a new format. Because if you wait 10 years to update a file to a new format, you might be screwed. Like text is gonna stay with us. I don't think we're gonna lose GIF or JPEG anytime soon. But you know what? There's a lot more PNGs than there used to be five years ago. So who knows? Consider either deleting or updating your stuff. It's really an important part of documentation and also part of sort of a clearer, freer lifestyle. All right. So when I say what we're trying to do with documentation, here's how I'm going to identify it. Documentation has to be true. It has to be both accurate and complete. No sins of omission, no sins of commission. Make sure it's right and complete. It has to be timely. Give the people what they want when they want it. Don't make them dig through 14 levels to get to the thing they need. Just offer them what they want when they want it. Even if it means flattening out your file structures, even if it means doing a whole bunch of like uh, surfacing and tagging, you want to make sure people can actually access the stuff that you've worked so hard on. Documentation has to be testable. If you cannot prove that your documentation is true in a regular testable way, you're screwing up. You're offering people something that may not be true. So if you can't test a procedure, if you are imagining how something ought to work, you're screwing up your documentation, stop it. Stop it. Test your documentation just as much as you test your code. Documentation should be tuned. You should be running analytics and seeing what people are using more and pointing your efforts toward that. Because universally applying your efforts across everything you have isn't how you code, is it? You're not like, I guess today I'll work on section B14 of the code. No, you're like, wow, this feature is kind of broken. I'm gonna go work on that. Or I'm excited I'm working on this feature. You focus your efforts and you need to focus your efforts with documentation too. So documentation components. When I say documentation, I'm, I'm trying to distill all of these years of experience down into something accessible. 
I will post these slides later so that all of the stuff that has, you know, bounced off your brain because it's already full is accessible. Uh, but here are some documentation components. Who's reading and why? Who is the audience? Assume that nobody wants to be reading documentation. This was my revelation like five years into technical writing. Anybody reading documentation is already pissed off because they haven't been able to do the thing that they want to do. They haven't been able to psychically intuit how to make this thing work. So anybody reading documentation already pissed off, just give them what they want and back away slowly. And ask yourself what's driving them to be here. Could you fix this with an interface change? Uh, are they trying to build something new and you could help them out by giving them more of a structure? Like what is driving people to be here reading the documents? What does a user need to succeed in this procedure? Um, I think it's really important and overlooked to uh, say what security level you need to execute something. Like if I need to be a super user, please say that at the beginning of the procedure. Um, I know that you're assuming it, but the thing that's gonna happen is as a user, I'm going to try to do this command and get bounced because I don't have the permissions, and then I'm gonna feel hostile and angry. Um, Every time we are rejected, we feel hostile and angry, and every time people feel hostile and angry about your software, they love it a little bit less. How can I change this product to need less documentation? So if people don't want to be reading documentation, the obvious solution is to make it so that the product doesn't require them to read documentation. Make it more intuitive, make it more obvious, script the things that are scriptable. For the love of God, if you need to enter the same things in every time, just make that part of the program. Because I don't want to be doing your job for you by entering in a whole bunch of command lines that are the same every time. Tell people if there is any hazard in this process. There are three levels of hazard warning officially in technical documentation. The first one is, this may cause something to behave a little weirdly. The second one is, you could lose data. And the third one is, holy shit, people could get killed. And the holy shit, people could get killed warning seems uh, extreme until you've seen somebody blow themselves across the room trying to discharge a monitor capacitor. So the young ones, the monitors, they used to have like depth of evil. The, the longer they were, the more they could kill you. Um, so if there's a possibility of you like throwing yourself across the room because you touch something with a screwdriver, that's really important to specify early on. How do I do this task as a user? What are the steps? What are the results? How do I know it worked? And what are the next steps? I already said some about like how, what, what you say about how you know it worked. So what I wanna say is like, you've completed the steps successfully, here's how you can tell. Because if you're not putting that check in, people can get a long way down a configuration checklist before they realize they missed something on step four. They, they could be on step 28 and not have what they need. So make sure you break it up and put checks in. And then tell them what they're gonna do next because you're giving them a roadmap. So we're gonna do another exercise, yay! Okay, uh, if we need more paper, I'm going to uh, put it up here and you can come get it. What we're gonna do is one person at your table is going to take a piece of paper and write two steps for a procedure on it and then fold the paper over so that only one instruction is showing and pass it to the next person. I know, you're all hilarious. And I hope you unfold them and read them. Yo. I hope you unfold them and read them quietly. Um, so the thing I want you to take away from that one is that in isolation, steps don't do you any good. You can get entirely the wrong idea if you don't have the context for what you're trying to do and how to know it, it succeeded. So I want you to remember this exercise the next time you're like, how hard can this procedure be? Remember that people are sometimes squirrels and cannot remember more than one step above what happened. So, Testing, how do you know a procedure worked? These people have a procedure that actually had a test step in, so they're, they're good to go. Um, 
if you can't test it, it's not a procedure, it's like a hypothesis. Uh, but not even a hypothesis, because hypotheses are testable. It's more like an opinion. Do you want to be spending your time writing technical documentation that's just an opinion? Because I don't. So what will the system do? What state change are you attempting to elicit by doing this procedure? How is it going to make a difference in the world? When we talk about reference documents, it's very difficult because reference documents are the most boring of technical documentation, which we already acknowledge is boring. What other stuff affects this? What are the optional settings? And what are related things? So I think of API documentation a lot because I write API documentation. But I think there are a lot of reference procedures where we're just like, I just want to look up the man page. I just want to see what all the possible options are and what they do so I can understand how to make this system do what I want. So understand that when people are looking at reference, they're not reading the reference any more than most of us read the encyclopedia. They're looking up the one thing they want. When you are writing code and code samples, please remember these things. The best code and documentation is code that you can modify and run in the documentation. This is why I love Swagger. You can run the code in the documentation and get a real result and everything works perfectly. The second best kind of code documentation is code that you can copy out easily. There's a little tab that lets you select your language and you can just copy and paste it into your system with your variable. Good to go. The worst kind of code documentation involves you ever typing code in. That is terrible because we have not been trained to be super accurate typists, I mean, except by misery, right? Because you typed something wrong. Retyping code out of documentation is just a way of introducing errors into a system. Don't make people do it. Make sure that you can cut and paste out of your documentation. So if you want to include these things, it's fun. Why did we build it this way? What else might you want to know? How have other people done this? Who here loves use cases? Yeah, no, really? Seriously? You don't want to, to watch how other people have won or failed at doing this thing? I love use cases. What is the end-to-end -end process? Like, where does this procedure fit in an entire spectrum of, of life cycle. Because knowing that can often help you diagnose where you've gone wrong. You don't need any of those, but they're useful. So documentation types, what kind do you want? Do you want instructions, which are tasks, integrations, and procedures? Make the thing do the thing. Do you want ideas, which describe architecture, or problem spaces, or this one I love, especially for internal documentation, discarded options. Why didn't we do that? So that people stop trying to do the stupid thing. Because they will keep trying to do the stupid thing if it seems like the logical option. And it's up to you to explain why we don't do that. Uh, processes. So a process is different from a procedure. A process is the human procedure, the way we get approval, the system that makes things go through a certain sequence of gates or a way that we can understand the launch process. These are all human-driven things. If you, can, if you can do it with a flowchart that involves a job title, it's a process. Action required documentation. I am so excited that I am now a developer advocate because you know what I don't have to do? Write release notes. 20 years of writing release notes. Release notes are the most read and possibly most hated documentation in the world. Because they mean you have to do something, we want you to upgrade, and they have to be exciting, scary enough, interesting enough to be you know, motivational to drive change, but also not so scary that we disclose that we just had a giant vulnerability that we're hiding. Um, it's kind of a delicate balance. And Never have I been more bored in my life than writing large corporate release notes. Uh, it, is, it is the land of the passive voice. An error was found 
in which it was discovered that if you click this, you expose all of your pictures to the internet, hypothetically, by unknown actors. Um, you also need to write deprecation notes. You need to say, we're done with Java 4. We are done supporting it. We're done. You have to come off it. Please, for the love of God, upgrade. We're not doing this anymore. Deprecation notes are very awkward because people have not moved for some kind of reason, which usually involves the OS 390 machine in their basement that is the core of their business. Um, but you still have to drive things. Yeah. Just regarding deprecation stuff, is there some kind of weird mental disease where people say stuff is deprecated without mentioning what it's been replaced by or what they've been using? Oh, that's a good question. Is, is there something that causes people to deprecate without saying what the upgrade path is? Uh, frustration. If they're deprecating it, they're like four versions past that already. And so they're like, we don't know how far up you can pull yourself, but we would like it if you joined us here in the future. Um, because that's the, the hidden subtext of every deprecation note is, please join us here in the future. Reference documents, usually used less than once a month per person, give or take. Um, they provide a lot of further detail, and they're very stable items. You should be able to leave reference documents alone. If they're changing really rapidly, you're either doing some massive re-architecting, or you should be talking about that more in release notes. Historical documents. We often don't think about saving these as technical documentation, but they're super important. Roadmaps of what you plan to do that then got derailed and drove off a cliff. Uh, project plans, ditto. But you need to know what you were aiming for, even if that's not where you ended up. And retrospective documents. I come out of a long, long career in agile, XP, lean, if you're not reviewing why things went pear-shaped, they will go pear-shaped again in the same way. If you review how they went pear-shaped the first time, if you're very lucky, they might go apple-shaped the next time. So you need to be looking at your retrospective documents and keeping them for why we don't do that thing anymore. Invisible documentation. Documentation you don't think about. So user experience is a kind of documentation Micro interactions, like you know when you go to fill in a form and it has the, um, the, the style of the thing that you're supposed to enter in it in gray text? That's a micro interaction. I'd like to speak to you about your visa people and their inability to put that in the form and how it is I'm supposed to enter my phone number because that took me like a long time. I'm like, do I really want to go to Australia badly enough to keep fighting this form? I guess. It was terrible. Um, error messages. Error messages are documentation. I care so much about this. Every error message should have three parts at least and probably four. And they are a unique identifier. Screw you if you're returning generic HTML error messages. There's one for I am not a coffee pot, I'm a teapot. You can find a better error message. It should have what caused the error. Like, that is not allowed, procedure not allowed, Proce or user not, not validated, whatever it is, what caused the error, what the mitigation is, how do you fix this? Thank you, you've told me I have a unique error, you've told me what it went wrong, how do I fix it? And even if sometimes it's like retry username and password, okay, whatever it is, you need to give people a way to go forward. And the last one is possibly a link to report. That's kind of optional, but I find it super useful. If people keep hitting the same error message, I want to know about it. Because there's either something wrong with my UI or with my code. I want to know where they're failing consistently. So if they get an error message more than once, I want them to be able to say, hey, I'm trying to do this thing. I'm getting this result. It's all very terrible. I want to know about that. So. That is the end of my presentation. I would love to take your questions if you have any. Otherwise, you can go to lunch a little bit early. Uh, but thank you all for coming and for your time and attention. Yes? How do we learn more?
do you learn more? Uh, so there is a Write the Docs meetup group in Australia, or you can come to the US. It's a really great conference uh, and Slack list and a community about how to be a better technical writer without necessarily being a technical writer. You had one. When someone comes from Google and says, I had a technical, I had a technical problem, and you ask to define what you're looking for, do you have any tools you recommend for that type of stuff? Ah, how do you have a, uh, we call it, yeah, we call it user uh, response thing. Uh, there are some tools, they're mostly built into the higher end tech writing tools, um, which is where I've seen them, but you can also, make your own. There's nothing that stops you from making a tiny you know, JavaScript response poll that says, did you find what you're looking for? Yes, no, I hate you so much. Um, don't actually allow them to mark I hate you so much because they will. Uh, don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> you think it's open source, but we don't know who the people are, and they're anonymous. Right. And the oh. is based upon the idea that you can identify who the user is. Right. So let me think about that for a little while. Yes. All right. Do I know of any large open source projects that I think have done documentation well? Uh, I just restructured the Red Hat Gluster documentation this year, so I'm very proud of that. Um, let me think. Um, actually, I really like, and this is very meta, I really like the GNOME documentation tool um, Mallard has pretty good open source documentation. Yeah. So if you work somewhere that doesn't have formalized documentation, how do you drive culture toward it? Yes. Uh, with, minimal budget. With, with minimal budget. That goes without saying. Nobody wants to spend money on this. That would be crazy talk. Um, if you want to drive the culture toward documentation, you need to show a value in it. So uh, when I want to do that, I do a cost benefits analysis. So like, here is the cost of looking something up currently. And uh, I've done a pilot project. Here is the cost of looking it up the new way where we have internal documentation. Assuming our developer time is worth you know, so much an hour, uh, we've saved uh, this chunk of change every time somebody looks something up internally. It is worth having internal documentation. So basically, uh, hit them in the pocketbook because that's the only thing they understand. Yeah. A tool uh, I mentioned. Oh, it was a like yeah, it was Swagger. Uh, the question is, how do you how do you find a tool that lets you execute code and documentation? There are several. I use Swagger for APIs um, because it's built to do that essentially. But there are, if you look at uh, the the search phrase you're looking for is uh, docs is code, code is docs, and uh, it'll give you a, a bunch more information on how people have managed to roll that in. And once you start looking for it, you'll see it. Um, Stripe has a really excellent example, also in API land, of being able to execute a call within the documentation and have a meaningful response. Yeah. Does Does Swagger have any resources on uh, API best practices? Documentation practice. Um, so there's a conference called API the Docs, and they recorded all their talks. Um, and the the person that you want to follow the blog of is uh, Christoph Van Tom, 
T-O-M-M-E. Uh, he, is, he is sort of the industry leader on API documentation best practices. Yeah. Um, back when you were talking about a situation where you were thinking, oh, how could we change the code to make the documentation not needed or mm -hmm. easier? Um, and this is from a personal experience of writing some documentation as a junior on a project. Um, OK, obviously, you should change the code and make it easier, but that's going to take time, and you want the documentation now. How do you balance, like, sort of commiserating with the reader? like? this is stupid and it would be a lot easier if it was like this. Or, I, I mean, I had a lot of problems with naming where there were confusing names for things in the software and I, you know, I could, of course, get those changed but they want the docs now. So sort of, you know, hi, this is called this. It would be so much easier if it was called this, you know, or it's the same name as this other thing but it's different. Like, how do you deal with that kind of stuff? It depends on the person. Okay, uh, let me see. How do you deal with the fact that you know your documentation is a hack around stupid code? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, it depends on the personality of your project, whether or not you can apologize to users. Uh, as soon as you get into enterprise, the answer is no. Um, they're just stuck with miserable and you cannot apologize to them because lawyers. Uh, but if you have an informal project, you can be like, we're working on this. So what I would do, and this goes back to my employer, we do feature flags. I would feature flag the apology and the code that you're working on so that you can pull it out as soon as you get it fixed. So um, you can wrap a little thing, a, a code comment, a, a comment essentially, around the, um, the apology so that you can pull it out instantly when you fix the code. And in the meantime, I want you to be developing the code at the point of pain of documentation. Even if you're not going to uh, deploy it right away, I want you to remember at the moment that you're doing it that you want this code in here. So, you know, don't necessarily deploy it or commit it as a feature flag or commit it as a, um, a commented out thing. But remember to put it in the code at the moment that you're dealing with the docs because you will forget later that this was a stupid thing you were fighting. Yeah. Sorry, do you mean feature flagging the documentation? Sure, there's no reason you can't feature flag the documentation. Nothing stops you from putting feature flags any damn place you want. Um, so if you're going to, like, I've been advocating for feature flagging documentation so that you only serve the documentation for the features people have licenses for. So, like, yeah, right? So if you know somebody is only licensed for two-thirds of your product, only deliver them the documentation for those two-thirds of the product and not the overhead of the rest. Yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. This, this uh, room is killing me. Yeah? All right, so how do you handle the fact that you just got hired to uh, write a bunch of documentation and you'd really rather be coding. Have you considered subcontracting? <laughs> um, I'm serious. The thing that I, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're the one who knows it. Uh, I, I literally have business cards that say better and cheaper than making your developer write it because I can learn the minimal amount to document something faster than you can learn how to do 20 years of technical writing. Um, but the answer is, if you are stuck doing it yourself because you're the only person who knows it, write down the tasks you expect someone to have to execute and answer those questions. Because once you have the questions, it's a lot easier than just trying to like mind barf out everything you know about this product. Um, so that's great. Yeah. So the, the answer is, you know, Consider it from the user point of view. What do they need to know first? And remember that there is no, uh, there's no real distinction between documentation and code. 
it's only a different language to make executables happen. And sometimes the executable has to go through the squishy gray brain and the fingers, but it's still an instruction code. All right, what do you got, Jack? Right, so how do you get people to deliver less of the product because they think the documentation is going to cause people to want to upgrade? And the answer is documentation is never what causes people to want to upgrade. Pain is what causes people to want to pay more money. So you can spend the same effort that you would spend uh, convincing someone to upgrade into convincing them that their life sucks without this thing. Um, but. I think that documentation flags as feature flags really gives you a lot of ability to make sure you have the documentation written before you, like you can write the documentation, you can launch darkly, and then when you're ready to turn it on, the documentation and the feature are on at the same time and there isn't any lag. All right, somebody over here, yes. Okay, the question is, are there any visualization tools for documentation? Um, there are, uh, but they require your documentation to be an extremely rigid format. So it's, I'm trying to remember, was it Textilio? Somebody. Basically anything that you could uh, make a site map with, uh, you could use as a documentation map. Um, there are no particular specialized tools that I know of uh, for documentation. Um, I'm, I'm now thinking about using Twine to do this, but uh, that's sort of uh, yeah. <laughs> excessive. Yeah. If you're an open source uh, maintainer and you needed documentation, uh, is there a particular project or template that you'd say go clone this and use this as your starting base? Because most Jack or is designed for blogs. Right. Uh, if you're a project maintainer and you want to start doing documentation, what should you steal from so that you can uh, have good templates? Clone it. Um, I, would, I would go to the Read the, read the Docs site, um, which is sort of a repository of a lot of open source documentation, and look through and see what you like. I can't think of any particular project off the top of my head, but that's Jekyll-based and uh, produces relatively solid output. I have trouble with Jekyll, it's very fragile about PDF, but um, it works. Uh, I actually love a technical writing tool founded by a couple Australians uh, called Corilla, and it is uh, a beautiful, object-oriented, markdown-centered, uh, publishes great output uh, project, and they are going to be around for at least a couple more years. I think they're doing okay. Um, and I really like the, the output that you get out of them. C-O-R-I-L-L-A. Evidently that means something to you all. I have been saying gorilla with a C for oh, the last two years. Like, yeah. That's just a, a carrot. Something. Okay. Oh, sorry. If all of your documentation is Word documents on SharePoint, how do you get it into something usable? Have you considered arson? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. What you do is um, you hire some, uh, not interns, because interns should get to do interesting things, but you hire somebody who's willing to do text conversion, and you get them to pull out the, out of Word, the best option is is text because the XML is that terrible um, and then you uh, put it into markdown probably uh, Get, github flavored markdown is probably going to end up being the standard the thing I hate about markdown is that there isn't a markdown there are markdowns um, and uh, then you'll have, like once you get it into Markdown, it's much more portable. You can put it in a lot of different formats. 
Pandoc, yes. Yeah. Uh, so Pandoc is a super programmable, like, pan translation document. And um, I don't spend a ton of time with it because it's very scripty, uh, but it works. All right, you had a question. I was just going to do a comment that it's usually not required because the Word documents will be at least two years old. That's true. <laughs> do you really need them? Unfortunately, it's too hard to get. Oh. You have a bigger problem. You, yes. have, <laughs> you, you have a process and people problem. All right, how are we doing? Did I get most everybody? You're going to be able to find me the rest of the day if you want to ask a question about your embarrassing SharePoint problems because I have pink hair. Um, and there are some people with pink hair, but not many. All right, thank you.